and then it's that one and maximize the thing. Yeah, if you need, you might need to move this out of the way. It's like a usual window hold there, yeah. and just yeah, to see your um, thing at the bottom. Right, ready? The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Right, hi everybody, and welcome to this session on reducing staff levels with Anita Wynn. Um, some of you will know this, because I know some of you were with us on Tuesday. So Anita has a long experience in HR and a lot of experience of dealing with our industry. So she sits on the board of one of our member centres, so she's one of the best people to listen to. Um, I'm just going to go through a couple of things before I leave you with Anita. We are recording the session, so after the session you will receive an automatic email from the system when the recording is ready to view. If your colleagues would like to see this, then they can simply take the booking link, register, and they will immediately see the recording play in the browser window. Okay, so if you have colleagues that you want to show this to, you can send them the booking link and they will be able to see the recording. In fact, we ran an excellent session on Tuesday, also with Anita, and if you or your colleagues missed that, you can simply follow the booking link for that session and you will also be able to see that recording. Um, okay, so with that, I will leave you with Anita. We are going to do questions, so if you have questions, if you look on the right-hand side of your screen, you should see a small questions box. You can write your questions there, if we have time, we'll deal with them at the end of the session, and they'll be dealt with anonymously, of course. So with that, thank you, Anita. Thank you. And I shall see you in a bit. Lovely. Well, we're going to turn the screen off so that you don't get distracted by looking at me and can see the uh, slide. So one moment while I just do that. And let's just, there we go. There we go. Uh, hopefully there you can now see, see my slides. So uh, as Tom said, good afternoon. Um, thank you very much for uh, registering. My name's Anita Wynn and I'm the co-founder of Best Start Human Resources. Um, to make sure that you have a, a little bit of faith in who you're listening to this afternoon, a little bit of background on myself and the company. I've been working in human resources now for over 25 years, but founded Best Start in nine years ago. And what we do is we provide HR services to organisations, including a number of English language schools, who either don't have their own dedicated HR teams, or for those larger organisations, we provide that extra pair of hands. We can also provide specialised services, such as consulting projects, on specific areas of HR. And in particular, we're spending, unfortunately, quite a bit of time at the moment looking at things like restructures, uh, performance management and changes to terms and conditions. So as I mentioned, we currently work with a range of schools, all at the moment who are continuing to face the challenges that are very much alive, as we all know, in the industry today. I don't think anyone can have failed to have noticed the student numbers are very much down and that we seem to be in this perfect storm that has created the situation that we're all in. There's a few uh, details there on the screen. The lack of an apparent imminent upturn suggests that the changes we see now require a rather significant shift in our overall business strategy, together with maybe some shorter term emergency measures to take us through. And unfortunately, as well as measures to recover sales, it's likely that many schools will be needing to look at reducing their cost base. As a member of the UK service industry, one of the largest elements of your cost base is likely to be your staff. So earlier in the week, we looked at what skills uh, a school, what things a school can realistically do to reduce their staff cost without actually making any job losses. But today we're going to focus on the employment laws surrounding restructures and redundancies. We're going to also have a look at the redundancy process and how we can put these things into place and reduce the impact on all staff, in particular those who are going to remain with us. As I mentioned on Tuesday, these two webinars shouldn't really be seen as an either or. A combined approach making some changes to staff costs is likely to reduce the need for as many job losses and would definitely increase the school's strength to survive. 
As Tom has mentioned, if anyone would like to hear the recording from Tuesday, uh, please register on the, on the booking pages. Now, I've got a huge amount to cover today, which is why we said we would try and do questions. So if you've got questions, please type them in and I'll do my best to answer them at the end. Um, however, despite the fact that I'm covering a lot, we will only be doing it at a very high level. So any of you who are considering restructuring or making redundancies should speak some specialist advice about your particular setting once you're ready to start. Now, before we dive in, I want to make sure we're all on the same page and we all know what a redundancy is. Now, that might sound a little daft or a little obvious, but I frequently get calls from clients saying that they want to make someone redundant. And actually, what they really mean is that they want to get rid of someone because they're not performing their jobs or they're on long-term sick. So what I thought we'd do is start by just talking about what actually a redundancy is. So under the law, an employee is dismissed for redundancy if either the employer has or is intending to stop operating the business altogether. So, for example, if a school went into liquidation or they decided to close the operation and wind it down entirely, and unfortunately we've seen some of those recently. And in these cases, all the employees are likely to be made redundant although there may be a staggered time frame uh, with people in HR, for example, or those involved in the building may take a little bit longer. Now, mergers or acquisitions are quite different, and in those cases, it's likely that TUPI will apply, and that's an issue for another day. Um, there is also uh, redundancy is defined when there is no longer a requirement for a particular role or a particular role in a location, so, for example, due to a decrease in demand, there's no longer a need for an accommodation manager or maybe a courses administrator. And as these are standalone roles, they could be made redundant. The final one is where there is a reduced need for a particular role. So, for example, you have 10 teachers now, but due to reduced student numbers, you'd like eight in the future. So, in summary, a redundancy occurs if the employer closes down altogether, where there is no longer a requirement for a particular role or a particular role in a specified location, or finally, if there's a reduced need for a particular role. Now, you'll notice in these definitions on the screen and as I've been talking, there is no mention of people. Under the law, people are not made redundant. It's roles and posts that are made redundant i.e. the role or post is removed because they're no longer required. Um, if you wish for an employee to leave you for any other reason, then it's not a redundancy. A good test is often, when they've gone, do you want to replace them? And if the answer to that is no, then it may be a redundancy. If the answer to that is yes, then it's likely to not be a redundancy. So that doesn't mean that you can't terminate their employment, but the process and the legislation covering it is quite different. And if anyone wants to talk to me about those, then speak to me offline. Happy to talk about that. So, although at first a redundancy process can appear rather complicated, it is actually relatively straightforward. The difficulty comes in dealing with people sensitively during what is normally a very highly charged emotional situation. And that's everybody, not just the individuals, but also all of those of you in management who are having to make these decisions. I know only too well how difficult that can be. As with all things, the key to a redundancy process such as this is to make sure that you prepare. Um, and that's preparing upfront before any conversations or announcements are made. And that preparation can actually take time. So make sure if you're thinking about reducing staff numbers, make sure you give yourself enough time before you actually want the process to start and finish to give yourself enough time to plan it properly. The more you plan, the less likely that there's going to be things that will go wrong and cause even more anxiety than there already will be. As well as a number of pieces of legislation that we need to make sure that we follow when making redundancies, we also need to ensure that we follow any procedure that your school may have, which may either be documented or set down by custom and practice. 
So many schools may actually have their own redundancy policy or redundancy procedure, or in previous years may have followed a particular pattern, which has then become custom and practice. So your first step is to have a look in your handbook or wherever you keep your HR policies and see whether or not your school has a prescribed process. If you do, then you'll need to ensure that not only do you follow the legislation, but you're also going to need to follow your own policy. Now, your policy is likely to cover such things as the duration of consultation, who consultation should occur with, selection methods, enhanced redundancy terms, and possibly even outplacement services. If you haven't got a policy, that's absolutely no problem at all. In fact, you're probably in a better position because you can be as flexible as you like. The next step is to complete a review of the school's structure. Um, or if you're not thinking about doing the whole organization, it could be an element of uh, just a department or a particular area in that school. My usual recommendation is to sit down and imagine you were setting up the school from scratch and identify which roles you would have and how many you would have of each. So you sit there and you think, in the ideal world, if I was setting up tomorrow, looking at my existing student numbers and the potential for slight increases maybe in the future, what would my school look like? What departments would I have? What roles would I have? The next step is then to compare that ideal with your actual and identify any actions you might need to take to try and get your school as close to that ideal as possible. Many uh, schools at this stage often think that it's better to try and make incremental, small steps towards that ideal. However, when we're talking about job losses or restructures, in my experience, what you can end up with is a sort of death by a thousand cuts. And actually doing the process in one foul swoop and really focus on getting your organization to the ideal position as quickly as possible is much less painful, even though at the time I'm sure it won't feel like it. Now, if we do this review of the structure of the organization, it's likely to create three scenarios, all of which you can handle under a redundancy or a restructure process. So you're likely to be able to identify jobs that in their entirety can be removed, eliminated, and not replaced. You may also find jobs that can be eliminated, but in the process that you may need to create new jobs where either work has changed or the level of the work that you wish to be performed has changed. So maybe there may have been a requirement for work to be done at a management level, but actually because of various different um, things that have happened, you might be able to have that down, done now by a more junior individual. Um, you may also identify that reduction in the number of jobs of the same type is required. So, for example, fewer teachers. Now, each of these scenarios requires a slightly different process, which we'll discuss a little bit later. But fundamentally, at this stage, you're identifying where possibly, it's all proposals at this stage, you may be able to make some headcount reductions. So we then need to have a look at some alternative courses of action. This, is, this, is, this will enable you to see whether or not there are other things that you might be able to do, some of the things we talked about in the uh, webinar on Tuesday, which would minimize the need for you to make all the identified job losses that, that you've talked about. This is important both from a legal perspective, but also to demonstrate to staff that any redundancies are a final straw rather than your first thought. And that can be particularly persuasive uh, during any consultation process. The final thing we need to do in the sort of preparation phase is to set out a timetable, both for the period up to the announcement, to ensure that all the paperwork has been prepared and everyone knows and feels well as comfortable as they can be with what needs to happen, but also a timetable for the period after the announcement, which lays out um, each of the scenarios and make sure that you're following either your legislative requirements or your school's policy. As a final little element here, if you think you're going to be making more than 20 redundancies in a 90-day period, then you will also need to complete something called an HR1 form. It's something that's often forgotten about. And this actually notifies the government, and this is where the government gets its statistics from, for job losses. Uh, details of HR1 forms are available on the Gov website. So what does a standard redundancy process look like? 
Well, it will be slightly different depending on whether you are eliminating jobs entirely or whether you're going to reduce the number of jobs of a particular type. We will look at these stages in a little bit more detail, but as an overview, I'd just like to take you through this slide. So first of all, if we, if we look at the slide um, under where it says with selection, so what we're looking at here is reducing the number of jobs of a particular nature. This process will involve some form of selection. So for example, we have 10 teachers and we now only need five. We're going to need to go through a selection process to select which five teachers we're going to retain. For any redundancy situation involving selection, the process will be, first of all, a period of group consultation where you're going to share with the entire group of people from whom the selection will be made a range of information, including the rationale for why you're proposing these headcount reductions, how many roles you're proposing to lose, the selection pool and how you're going to go about the selection and the criteria you might be using, and any alternatives that you're thinking about. Employees should be invited to make suggestions for changes to your proposal and maybe even come up with some different approaches, but also to raise questions during that period. And at the end of the group consultation phase, the proposal is then confirmed and selection occurs. Following the selection, and as I mentioned, we'll be talking about selection in a little bit more detail later, the individuals who are going to be retained are informed and those who are not are placed at risk of redundancy and that is a technical legal term that we have to use. So the individuals who, we, who are not selected to stay are placed at risk of redundancy. They then have a period of individual consultation where there's a further opportunity for them to question, challenge the selection and to consider alternatives to prevent them being made redundant. At the end of that consultation phase, if nothing has changed, then the individual is issued with a notice of redundancy. Again, another legal term. And it's at that stage that the individual is told that they are definitely going to be made redundant. And the notice of redundancy triggers the employee's notice period to start. All individuals then have the right to appeal the decision, just as you would any other dismissal. So in summary, for those with selection, we will be looking at announcement, group consultation, a selection, some individual consultation, notice a redundancy issue, and then an appeal. Now for processes which involve job elimination, i.e. where we're removing whole jobs and, the, and you've only got one individual performing that job, so no selection, the process is very similar as you can see on the other side of the slide here. It just misses out the group selection and, uh, group, uh, and the, the group consultation and the group selection phase. So from announcement, you go straight to individual consultation and then move this through the stages as before. So we have announcement, individual consultation, notice of redundancy, and then appeal. So let's just have a look at some of those in a tad more detail. So we're going to start with selection, which is often where many people get themselves a little bit concerned. As I said, selection only occurs when you are reducing the number of jobs of a particular nature. So the first thing that it's important that you do is to identify initially what is your selection pool. Which members of staff should be in that pool from who you are going to select those to be retained. Now sometimes this is really obvious. We have two finance assistants and we now only need one. The obvious pool is the two finance assistants. Pretty straightforward. On other occasions, however, you might need to consider slightly wider than that. So let's think of an example. You want to reduce the administrative support in the school. However, we have six administrators, all who work in different areas, doing slightly different jobs, but fundamentally all are administration staff. Should the pool be all six or should it be divided into areas where you actually uh, need, uh, need less staff? There's a balancing act of ensuring that all relevant people are included and, make, and on the other hand, making the pool so large that it actually causes a huge amount of unnecessary uncertainty across a wide area of the school. Um, looking at pools for teachers is often an interesting one and deciding whether or not the, the pool should be all teaching staff 
or if you have a, a reduction in a particular course or a particular need for a type of trainer, teacher, should you restrict the pool to just those who currently perform that and deliver that particular course? So that's often an area that you need a little bit more support and advice on. You also then need to decide on how you're going to do the selection. This can either be a management-led process where managers rate staff across a number of criteria during which the employee does not participate in any way, or it can be a selection process which looks more like a recruitment process, for example, which involves interviews or tests which the employee has to undertake. And you often hear about this, oh yes, I had to interview for my job, and, and that's this type of, of selection process. The choice depends on you, your school, your preference. It also depends if you have a policy or if you've used a previous process, you may need to follow that. And it also can depend on the nature of the role that's being selected for. The important thing of all of this is that you use fair criteria and it's applied consistently to everyone concerned. So on the topic of selection criteria, um, these are usually a mix of knowledge, qualifications, skills, hard and soft. Um, so for example, could be organization skills, communication skills, or the experience that you need to do the job. Again, I like to suggest to clients that they think back and say, if I was hiring for this role tomorrow and I could actually knit the ideal employee, what would be the perfect mix of knowledge, qualifications, skills, experience that you'd like for this job? And that should be your selection criteria. You are looking to retain the best possible person or people to do your job. It's preferable that some of these criteria use hard data or hard evidence, but by no means do all the criteria have to be entirely objectively measurable. So it's absolutely fine to have both quantifiable and qualitative selection criteria. You can also use things like reliability, which are a nice broad category to cover things like absence and punctuality, although we will talk about absence in a little bit more detail later. The one thing you must do when looking at selection criteria is to avoid any that would disadvantage any specific group, and in particular, any group that's protected under the Equality Act. So, for example, many people will still think of the old LIFO, last in, first out criteria. That is actually considered to be age discriminatory now and shouldn't be used except in very, very rare circumstances. The other thing is, is uh, using maternity or disability related illness. If you're looking at absence, all of those things have to be removed from absence figures before you can use absence levels uh, to look at reliability. So you do need to think about if you're using a particular criteria, will that disadvantage any specific group and particularly any specific group that's protected under the Equality Act? Now, who should actually do the selections? Well, they should be performed by the people, the person, who is most familiar with the individual's capability. And so for most people, that's usually their line manager. It's advisable, however, not to have one individual to do the selection process. Otherwise, that opens you up to um, criticism and possibility of accusations of favoritism, bullying, and all those things. So normally, we would recommend at least two, if not three people, are involved in the selection process. So the line manager, somebody else who may have a, a view and opinion of the employee, and often the third person, an independent facilitator, who is there to make sure that the criteria are applied consistently across all of the staff. And that will help to defend and to demonstrate um, that there's been no bias in the selection process. During the process, any relevant evidence or documents that you might have available, so appraisals, uh, absence records, CVs, all of these should be referred to. And finally, a record of the conversation that you have during that selection process, any ratings that you give, and any evidence that you use should be made. And these can be shared with employees during consultation if they request it. So let's take a quick look at consultation. So um, if we're talking about a selection process, we'll have group consultation. But for all different all processes, there will be some element of individual consultation. 
Um, if you think you may be making 20 or more redundancies in a 90-day period, then you are obliged by law to consult for 30 days with recognized trade unions, staff representatives, or if the staff have neither of these with the individual themselves. In my experience with most schools, I nearly always end up consulting either with staff representatives or with individuals directly. Um, the choice is yours. But this is a legal requirement if you're making 20 or more redundancies in a 90-day period. If you think you're going to have under 20, then there is no prescribed duration in law for consultation. Instead, they say it must be reasonable, which is helpful because I wonder what reasonable is. Um, you might want to also look in any policy that you may have because that the length of consultation may be defined in your redundancy policy. However, if you're going to go under 20 and you don't have a policy, then it's entirely up to you. However, I would suggest that the shortest period of consultation would be two weeks. And consultation starts from the moment you make the announcement and lasts all the way through the process until you issue notice of redundancy. Now, as we've already said, some processes require that group consultation phase where you are going to collectively share information with a group of individuals or their representatives, and then you're going to respond back to them as a group or through their representatives. However, all the processes do require some element of individual consultation as well. And during individual consultation meetings, there is prescribed information that you must share and must discuss in order for them to believe that the consultation has been meaningful. And some of those elements are placed on the slide there, and we talked about a little bit earlier when we were talking about group consultation. So in the group consultation phase, you must share with them the rationale for why you're doing this, any alternative measures you've tried in order to avoid making redundancies, uh, the roles and the areas that are likely to be affected, the number of potential redundancies, and how you intend to um, select those people for redundancies, both in terms of the pools and the selection criteria, and how you intend to um, make redundancy payments as well. So that's for group consultation. For individual consultation, it's much more around the process that's been used an exploration of alternatives, including alternative roles, and an opportunity for the individuals to challenge decision-making and for questions and answers to be given. Um, it's beneficial to take notes and keep records at, um, at all uh, uh, consultation meetings. Um, this allows you to um, be able at a later point to come back to uh, a document and say, we did discuss this, and actually to be able to evidence that. It also can be very useful if you've got a number of people you're talking to, to note down their questions and concerns. Uh, you're less likely to forget anybody. Individuals do have the right to be accompanied at all individual consultation meetings by either a recognized trade union representative, a staff representative, or a work colleague. The exact same guidance and rules apply to this as there is for disciplinary or grievance meetings. In effect, um, when you carry out this process, when you get to the end, you're actually dismissing someone for the reason of redundancy. So many of the rules and regulations surrounding disciplinaries will also apply in a redundancy scenario. Let's um, go on and have a look at the documentation in a little bit more detail now. We've talked a little bit there about making sure you've got records of meetings and conversations that happen, but there are actual specified pieces of information that you need to provide throughout the process. Um, by nature, the announcement right at the beginning and, and the early consultation meetings are usually done orally and face-to-face, -face. Um, although there are those terrible horror stories of where people decide to make these announcements by text. Never a good move. Um, however, as most employees, when you first talk to them about this and you mention the R word, restructure or redundancy, they will go into immediate shock. And Usually, as soon as they hear that word, you can see the shutters come down, and very little after that will they be taking on, particularly if you're trying to share quite a bit of detail and timetables and things like that. Um, so therefore, it's extremely beneficial to provide written information for them to take away and absorb after that meeting at the beginning there. Um, 
it allows them to go away, it allows them to think about it, it allows them to make you to make sure that they've got all that information. Um, but it also can prevent lots of questions coming backwards and forwards. Um, it demonstrates that you're treating everybody consistently and sharing the same information with everybody. Um, but it can also be extremely useful to prove that the consultation information required by law was provided you by yourselves if things should go a little sour. Now, there are two documents which must be provided in writing to employees by law, and that is an at-risk letter and a notice of redundancy letter. The previous flowchart um, on the previous slide indicated when these needed to be provided, um, but they contain very specific information which is outlined in the law, and we also use them to demonstrate that we've shared the, the information that we need to share. It's really important that the content of these letters is correct and therefore they should be either provided by an expert or you should have your letters reviewed by an expert. Um, it's important, as I mentioned earlier, that um, terminations due to redundancy is considered under the law the same as dismissals and therefore um, individuals who are made redundant can go to tribunal and claim unfair dismissal which means that uh, an employment tribunal will not only look at the, the rationale and the reasons, but more importantly will be looking at the process you used. And simply getting letters wrong or not providing information to employees when you needed to employ them can be enough for them to consider that the process wasn't fit and proper. So I can't stress that enough. Um, in addition, as I've already mentioned, you should keep meeting notes of all the consultation meetings so that you can demonstrate um, what was covered and who asked what and when. Moving on and uh, looking at the after notice, the notice of redundancy has been given. As I mentioned earlier, when you issue notice of redundancy, this is the final, nearly the final stage in the process. And at this point, you're confirming to an employee that they are actually going to be made redundant and their notice period will start counting down from that date. Um, so at this point, we are usually starting to consider, if not prior to this, what are the payments that are going to have to be made to this redundant employee. Now, all employees who are employees, and that might sound a bit obvious, but this doesn't apply to freelancers or those who are contractors, self-employed contractors, only applies to employees who have over two years service are entitled to a statutory redundancy payment. Um, this has a specific calculation and it's calculated using their weekly pay but being capped at £479 a week, uh, their age and their length of service. So fundamentally anyone who is over 41, it's uh, one and a half weeks per year of service. For those under that age, it's one week for each year of service. Um, the easiest way these days, though, to calculate redundancy pay is to use the government's redundancy calculator. It's really easy to use, uh, and not only does it give you the figure, it explains how it calculates it. Um, I generally also give this to employees who are making redundant so they can go and check for themselves. Um, all statutory redundancy pay is made tax-free. Um, if you have a redundancy policy that we talked about a little bit earlier, then or you've made redundancies recently, you may have enhanced redundancy payment arrangements. Um, and if you've, your policy says that you do, or you've done it in the near past, you will need to honour that. Um, but it is important that you look at how you might enhance those redundancy payments, because once again, you cannot do something which would be discriminatory. So you need to look very carefully about how you go about um, enhancing redundancy payments. In addition to redundancy payments, you'll also need to pay employees their notice. This is the more generous of either their contractual notice or their statutory notice. So statutory notice is one week for each completed year of service up to a maximum of 12 weeks. So in your contract, if you have one week's notice um, and someone has eight years service, I'm sorry, it's eight weeks notice. It's whichever is the more generous of the two. Now you may decide to ask your employees to work their notice. You might decide them to pay, pay them in lieu, often called a pylon payment, or you might get to do a combination of both. 
my experience most um, companies with redundant employees will either make a payment in lieu of notice or ask them to work just a little bit and then um, make a payment generally motivation levels of those individuals who are going to be redundant will naturally be a lot lower um, and it makes this, the environment really difficult for those who are staying as well. So generally, pay and love notice may be a, a better idea for you to consider. Now, the tax treatment of payments in lieu of notice, so pylons, is very, very tricky. And um, please get advice on that. Um, I'm happy, happy for you to give me a call and I'll talk you through it. Um, once you know, it's quite straightforward, but it's not a general rule that applies to everybody. You'll also need to pay holiday that they've accrued up to their termination date, but they haven't been able to take. Um, and pension contributions and other benefits up to their termination date. Pension contributions must also be made on any um, pay in lieu of notice clauses. That's relatively new. Uh, last year, the year before last, it was finally ruled on. Prior to that, we used to be able to not make pension contributions on pylon payments. And before we finish up and leave some time for questions, I just want to talk you through a number of special circumstances. Um, some of these are more common than others. So let's first of all take voluntary redundancies. Um, many school policies will include the need for any schools to ask for voluntary redundancies when they're running these processes. And it's often one of the first questions I will get asked is, should we, should we ask for volunteers? Um, if your policy states that you will ask for volunteers, then you're going to have to have a very good reason for not following that. If you don't have a policy, or it doesn't say this in your policy, then it's entirely your choice whether you ask for volunteers or not. You do not have to ask for volunteer redundancies during a voluntary redundancy process. Um, to be honest, in my experience, it's not always a great idea to ask for volunteers because then you don't have any control of who's going to volunteer and what role volunteers. So you might need uh, less staff in the teaching area, let's say, but all of a sudden all your volunteers come out of your um, administration or your sales team or vice versa. You could do with a reduction in your administration staff, but actually you suddenly have four teachers who you really didn't want to volunteer, volunteer and come forward. Um, even if you do ask for volunteers, then you still need to follow an at-risk consultation notice process, the one we outlined above, and give them all the relevant documentation. This is essential not only for employment law purposes, so just because they volunteer, they still have the right to have all of those um, pieces of paper and go through all those processes. Um, but also, more important for the individual concerned, that if um, the state believes that the individual volunteered for redundancy, in some occasions those individuals may have to wait anything up to 12 weeks for any of their state benefits to kick in. Whereas if it's a compulsory redundancy, then they get it from day one. So it's really important that they still have the same paperwork as everybody else. Otherwise, your lovely people who step forward to help you out may be quite severely disadvantaged. Um, maternity and long-term sickness. Now, although in, you know, people will have heard me speak before, no one is untouchable. Those on long-term sickness, and more importantly, those on maternity leave, need to be handled with incredible caution. So, and that doesn't mean you should ignore them, and it doesn't mean that you should keep them out of the process, and it doesn't mean that you can't touch a particular group because you've got somebody in maternity leave in that group. It just means you really, really must get advice. In particular, maternity is one of the really odd exceptions in our um, employment law. And actually, if you have a lady on maternity leave or a gentleman on shared parental leave, and you have an alternative vacancy, which we're going to talk about in a moment, they have an automatic right to that vacancy. It is the only area in UK legislation where we have positive discrimination. Uh, and it's caused by numerous pieces of legislation being drafted and not being um, coordinated together. So maternity, long-term sickness, please don't ignore it. Please don't use that as an excuse not to address an area, but please make sure you get some advice because you need to handle it carefully. Now, bumping. Everyone always laughs when I put that out. This is actually a legal term. It's actually defined in the law. 
and it's when an employee who is at risk of redundancy during consultation says that they should be considered for a role which has somebody already in it who's not at risk. And what happens is this then instigates a new selection process which can result in the person who was at risk originally being retained and somebody else being bumped out of their job and then having to go through a redundancy process. So this can sometimes happen if your selection pool is too narrow and particularly in roles where you may have a very generic skill set, so admin or secretarial. So you may have a number of uh, administrators or who do slightly different jobs. Uh, you decide you don't want a courses administrator and so you don't have a selection process because you only have one courses administrator. But actually when you get that courses administrator into individual consultation, she goes, oh, it's okay. It doesn't matter, I, I know I haven't got enough work here, but I could do that job over there and points to another administration job which is equally they are capable of doing. It also can happen when you have a supervisor or a line manager who may have been promoted from within and then you've made, you've made their position at risk of redundancy and they turn around and go, actually, okay, I understand my thing, but I can do one of my team's roles. I want to be considered for one of those roles. Um, to be honest, it's never pleasant. It always creates an awful lot of bad, um, bad feeling within the organisation, but it is allowed in law and there are some things you can do to try and prevent that happening up front. The final one actually addresses a question we had the other day, which is all about suitable alternative roles versus alternative roles. So during consultation with um, employees who are at risk of redundancy, you're obliged to consider any vacancies within the organisation which the at-risk employee could perform. Now, this has to be an open vacancy. We're not asking you to create them. And it has one that you're currently recruiting for. Now, if that vacancy is similar or requires very similar skills and experiences and is of a similar level in terms of hierarchy in the organization, then this is considered suitable alternative and employment. And in this case, any at-risk employee must be given first dibs, first choice for that particular role because it is so similar to the one in which they are leaving. They also have the right to take that role on a trial basis after which either, either side can decide it's not working and then the individual returns back to being at risk of redundancy and we start the consultation process again. Um, suitable alternative roles should be offered on the employee's original terms and conditions. Now, alternative roles, don't know why we couldn't come up with a different name, why we've only just dropped one word. Alternative roles are those within the organisation which are not similar to the at-risk employee's existing role for a variety of reasons. So that could be skills, it could be experience, it could be knowledge, but it's often to do with hierarchy and levels within the organisation. In these cases, the at-risk employee must be given the ability to apply for these, but they don't have to be given the role, and they may be considered alongside others, including those from outside of the organisation. So they just become another candidate, but you have to let them know that that vacancy is there and that they can apply for it. The individual then applies for, and if they're lucky enough to get it, accepts that position on the terms and conditions relevant to the position they've applied for. So often in that case, it may be a drop in salary. I appreciate that I've whizzed through that in 45 minutes, uh, and that was an awful lot of information for you to take in. I've tried to keep it as straightforward and simple as possible, but I have covered things at very high level. So, as I said at the beginning, I would highly encourage anyone who's considering restructuring or making redundancies to get some advice as soon as possible, as early in the process as possible, in order to make sure that they're uh, jumping through the right hoops. Tom's coming back in a moment uh, to see if we've got any questions that have come through, and uh, we'll answer those as we go along. Excellent, right, thank you Anita. So, let's just try and work this a second. Okay, there we go. So you can see us both. So now, if you do have any questions for Anita, you can type them in the right hand side of your screen. And we have a few minutes, so we'll see how many we can get through. So, here we have already a first question. 
One second. It's the beauty of technology. We're just trying to make it big enough that we can actually read it. Let's see. Aha. Okay, that's not the best, but there we go. Oh, we've got lots of questions. Okay, give me one second, guys, and I will work out how to bring this out. There we go. Okay, so. Is it possible to totally decide on a structure and redundancies based on a management selection process or criteria? Do you not need to have an interview process too? such as getting staff to apply for the jobs? Not at all. On. It's entirely your choice. And it, this will often depend on the school's culture, on the jobs that you're apply, that you're restructuring. It is absolutely considered to be a legal, correct process to have a selection entirely driven by management decision. It is really important in those cases that you have um, fair selection criteria, which you've shared during group consultations so that um, uh, staff will have the opportunity to see what those are and to participate and to suggest other ones. Um, it's really important that there's a fair rating process that's used. So usually we would say one to five, something like that. Um, and that you have the right people making those selection decisions. So you have the right people in the room at the time making those selection decisions. Um, Actually, sometimes that is an awful lot less painful than asking individuals to actually interview and apply for their job. And what I often find is if you ask a, a staff member to interview for their own job, and then you've got the interview panel of trying to make the decision, how do you differentiate between your existing knowledge of an employee and what you know they do on a day-to-day -day basis and how they've just come out in an interview? So it is absolutely fine for you to choose one or the other. Okay, thank you. And an interesting question, this goes back to what you said at the start, where you were very clear that redundancy is about roles yes. and not people. But what if you've got one person in each role? Yep. How would you, is that really a redundancy then? Because presumably... So what if fundamentally all roles are still the same and there is only one person in each position? Effectively, we cannot make any jobs redundant according to your advice. Can we not ask, you, ask for volunteers? So what, what we're saying is if we've got a whole bunch of roles, all with one person in them, if each of those are standalone roles, so there is no similarity, so you only have one teacher, one receptionist, one salesperson, one director, one finance assistant, one whatever, and you're saying, okay, we've got six people in our, in our school and we can only afford five, I would still suggest as a management team you could decide which of those six roles you need to do without and then you make that role redundant. Of course you could ask for voluntary redundancy, but what happens if your one teacher is the person that volunteers? You're going to struggle to be a school with no teachers mm -hmm. in it. So that's the trouble with volunteering for redundancy. Mm -hmm. um, the likelihood is that you will have a number of teachers or a number of administrators mm -hmm. or a number of finance assistants and you need less of them. And so what you're saying is we've got four teacher roles, we need three teacher roles, and then you go through a selection process. Mm -hmm. Or you might say we've got one accounts assistant and we no longer can afford accounts assistant, so that role is made redundant and the person in it is placed at risk. Right, okay. Does that make okay, sense? Okay, yeah, I think so. So even with one person, one role, it's still the role is the still role is not redundant. sustainable in yeah, the business. Yeah, exactly. It, you, you, this is the, always the difficult. You make you remove the role is no longer required. Therefore, the role is redundant. But the person who currently performs that role is at risk of redundancy. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. I would also say we did discuss. Um, there were some questions sent in before. Some of them are difficult to discuss over a webinar. So where we can't, we will try to get written advice back to people. So I had a question actually. As a, as oh, as go on then. And one of them was it was a question that came up on Tuesday. Um, to do with notice or the periods that run through these processes. So there's, yep. a, there's a question where if a notice period or a consultancy yes. period or these other yeah. periods How are running 30 run? days. Exactly, yeah. yeah, because I noticed in one of the slides it's, an initial talk and then it's yep. a letter okay. and then so how yep. does that run? Okay, so let's assume we're making over 20 redundancies. I'd hope that most of you aren't in quite that situation, but let's, let's do the over 20 first. So you're talking a minimum of 30 days. It starts when you make an announcement and it finishes when you issue notice of redundancy and then you have your notice period. Right, okay, okay. If we're making less than 20 redundancies, 
Uh, therefore, and we don't have a policy, and therefore we can consult for as long as we like. That's why I say two weeks is usually a good one. Starts with announcement, two weeks, we finish the notice of redundancy, and then the notice period starts. So with redundancies, unlike what we were talking about the other day, mm -hmm. consultation has to start and finish before notice starts. Okay. Which can make, if, you're on, if you've got 12-week notice periods, can make this feel like a very long process. Mm -hmm. And that's why many uh, organisations choose to pay in lieu of notice, right. so that actually it's all done and dusted quite quickly, and okay. the rest of the organisation can move on, okay. and the redundant employee can move on with their life too. Okay. It's equally as important. And just, so taking that a little bit further for some of our members, if it's anything like the centres I used to work in, <laughs> which didn't need to make redundancies, I should add, <laughs> not while I was there anyway. With um, 20 employees, is that 20 full-time employees, or mm -hmm. is it zero hours? How does that support 20 temporary staff? Bodies. 20 okay. people. So um, zero hour staff have exactly the same uh, rights. If they are zero hour employees, okay. they have exactly the same rights as full time, part time okay. employees. So exactly the same scenario. Right. Fixed term contractors, mm -hmm. we had this conversation the other day. Yeah. If you've got fixed term contractors who are over two years service, which you shouldn't have, but if you have, then they also go into the pot because okay. they also have unfair dismissal rights, so they have to be treated exactly the same. If you've got fixed-term contractors with under two years service, then you can do things slightly differently. And then, okay. of course, you've got freelancers and contractors. They're all outside of this process. Okay. Okay, we have some more questions in. Okay. So, what if you only have enough work for 10 year-round teachers, but you have 14, for example? Yep. Do I make four year round positions redundant and retire those people to minimum wage contracts? Would this be a change in their terms and conditions? How would that work? I yep. suppose that's if you want to retain their yeah, services. Yeah, you retain their services. So yes, if you've got only got enough work for 10 at the moment, but you have 14, my first question would be to say to you, um, check that you haven't got a layoff or short term working clause in your contract because that might be an option for you that you could lay them off for a period of time so they're still available for you to come back. Um, when you want them. If you haven't, or you don't want to go down that line, yes, you would be making four year-round positions redundant. And then you would be speaking to those individuals and saying, okay, um, I can, my alternatives, rather than making them redundant, my alternatives would be to offer them a position on a minimum weeks contract. Um, and that is, yes, it's a change to their terms and conditions, but it's done as an alternative. It's an alternative position, alternative role okay. that you're offering. So they wouldn't then be made redundant. They wouldn't then get, receive a redundancy pay. They have accepted okay. an alternative position. In my experience, in reality, what happens is they get made redundant. They go away for a short period of time. Then they come back to you and you either hire, so they've had their redundancy pay and they've had their notice pay, and they come back to you and they either come back to you as a fixed term contractor on a new minimum weeks contract where you've rehired them or you have them as a freelancer. Okay. I suppose elements of that are in the Tuesday's talk of how to reduce Correct. costs without the job yeah, losses. Absolutely. So if you haven't seen that talk, yeah. you can find my emails to you with the booking link to that. Simply register a place. As soon as you register a place on the Tuesday seminar, it will start to play in your browser. So you might find some of the answers in there as well. I must get to this last question because it's somebody after my own heart. Uh, great talk. Can you give some examples of qualitative selection criteria? For example, would a positive attitude towards the organization be valid as a criteria? Absolutely. Um, what I like to see when I do selection criteria, I would never have more than eight. Of course, it gets a bit wieldy. Normally, somewhere between five and eight. You would have some that would be qualitative. So you could, if, it, if you're talking about a teacher, it might be around feedback, positive feedback that they've received. Um, it might be repeat bookings or something. You know, if a, a particular teacher gets lots of repeat bookings, if they do a lot of one-to-ones. So anything like that that you can quantify. Um, you can quantify absence. We talked about that earlier and things like that. Um, but in terms of the softer side, having a positive attitude, commitment to the organization, flexibility, all of those things can happily be used as selection criteria. So getting the balance right and making sure you're comfortable that you can rate people on those. Okay, that's very interesting because I suppose my, if I were to take on a question from that would be, I know that if you say had feedback forms from the students, you could say, well, this is from the students, it's from an external source. Yes. Whereas I wonder whether the employee who is undergoing the process could say, well, positive attitude to the 
organization if you are saying that to me yep. and it's your quality it's of judgment, judgment yeah could they not argue back and say you are not you're making a wrong judgment oh they can argue absolutely okay. um this is where getting the group consultation phase is right so in right. the group consultation phase you've told the guys these are the criteria you're going to use and you've told them positive attitude towards the organization is going to be one of my criteria right they don't make a fuss at that point you told them that's what you're going to do. Okay. They get an, an opportunity to come back to you and say, I okay, don't like that criteria. Right, okay. They don't, fine, we're going to use it. Okay. But also we have to remember that they will come back and argue yeah. that as an employer, it is your right to outline what a positive attitude to your organization okay. is. And I, as a manager, represented by them, have a right to say that. Okay. And as I'm selecting what I say, yeah. is how we're working on it. Okay. That. And that's absolutely fine. And a lot of people suddenly go, oh my goodness me, you know, will they argue back? Mm. Yes, they will, but that's okay. Okay. As long as you can provide evidence and defend okay. what you're saying, absolutely fine. So even with the qualitative, it's that aspect of consultation, also robust criteria. Absolutely, yeah. And the one of the real keys to making this smooth is about having, making sure you've got, you've thought through all of these things way up front so that when it comes to doing it it's a really smooth process okay. that problems occur where there's not enough thinking goes up front halfway through the process someone goes i don't like that selection criteria and everyone mm -hmm. starts running around going, well actually i don't know how are we going to measure that selection okay criteria? yeah and it's we start having an issue okay all right and as i said guys there's some questions that we're going to respond to in writing okay so if you haven't seen your question come up that's fine oh do we have to give examples or evidence of what a positive attitude is and can show when the employee displays it yes yeah I mean you what I would normally do on my uh, selection criteria forms I actually use a spreadsheet have the criteria down the left hand side have a rating one to five and then have an evidence box and in there I'm not asking it's not war and peace but it's just be one or two examples of where someone has demonstrated or not as the case may be um, those positive attitudes so that if someone later says, why did you give me a five or a yeah. two or a one? I can go, well, these are the things here. So okay. yes, that's a really good one. All right, excellent. I think we're just about out of time, unfortunately. So if you want to keep, if there are questions, I know I covered a lot and I know particularly you'll be thinking about this in your own setting. Please um, contact me direct. The um, details are on the screen. Or if you want to remain anonymous, and I understand that there is a levels of sensitivity here, email the questions to Tom and we'll provide you with some written response. Absolutely. You can get in touch with me. I'm happy to pass things on. Everything is treated as confidential, of course, and with discretion. Um, so thanks, Anita. Not at all. Before Thank you log off, I just remind you again, please share these links with people. You can send them around. People will better watch a recording. We are recording. And uh, in an hour or so, it will convert and you will get an automatic email to allow you to access that recording of this session. Just leaves me to say, if you do want more information from Best Start, you've got the contact details. You can get in touch and sign up to their newsletter. I guarantee you, being a subscriber myself, they will not bombard your inbox. It's very light touch. It's very, very useful information. So I'd encourage you to do that. So... Thank you. It's a tough topic, but I okay. hope that's helped. And I hope you have a great afternoon and weekend. Thanks very much for joining us. Thank you.